Well, good morning. He is risen. Very nice. As we continue this morning, uh, we've heard a lot of these discussions about new life and new birth and Jesus coming and making something new in us. And um, it just took me to an interesting passage. Um, how many of you, what, 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 would, what would you say is the most famous Bible verse of all? John 3.16, right? And there might be a few others. I, I, I really like Jesus wept because it's short. I can memorize that one really easy. Uh, that's John 11.35. Um, but probably the most famous Bible verse is John 3.16. How many of you know the context of that verse? We quote that verse all the time. For God, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Or if you're like me and have memorized it in the King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Really famous verse. We know that one to a T. It's really interesting. This verse comes right smack in the middle of Jesus' teaching on new birth, on being born again. This verse comes, John 3, starting in verse 1, there's a story of Nicodemus who comes to talk to Jesus. And I just want to read through this. I want us to kind of have a little bit of uh, uh, fun, put you on your imagination. Um, we're going to read through this story together. I'm going to read it out of the message um, translation. When, when Eugene Peterson sat down to, to translate uh, the Bible, he, was, he sat down and he says, I, I got this neighbor. He's a truck driver. He's got a fifth grade education. And I want to, I want to translate this in a way where it's a story. So we're going to read a story today. Um, and it, I, want us to, I want you to put on your imagination and just imagine this conversation as we go through this together. We're going to read, starting in John chapter 3, we're going to read 3 through 21. Uh, and here goes the story. There was a man a Pharisee, of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader amongst the Jews. Late one night, he came to visit Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know you are teaching straight from God. No one could do all of the God-pointing and God-revealing acts that you do if God were not in it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible for him to see what I am pointing to, to the kingdom of God. Jesus going, yeah. Unless you, unless you know God, you don't know what I'm talking about. How can we do, how can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? Can we re enter a mother's womb and be born again? What are you saying, this born from above talk? Nicodemus going, I don't get that. What are you talking about? I don't get it. I think Jesus gets a little snarky here. <laughs> Jesus said, You're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving in the visible, a baptism into new life, it is not possible to enter the kingdom of God. It's interesting here. He, he's referencing something that Nicodemus would recognize very quickly as a prominent Jew of the Pharisee sect. He knew his Judaism very well. And Jesus is referencing the creation, the original design. He says, Jesus goes on and he says, let me put it this way. Let me give another explanation. When you look at a baby, it's just that. A body, you can look at it, you can touch it. But the person who takes shape in that form, shape within that form, by something you cannot see and touch, it's the spirit. The spirit becomes alive, a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, not out of this world, so to speak. It's something fundamental. It's something to our core. It's who we are. It's this inner thing that happens in us. More than just a physical act or behavior that we do, but it, 
it's a part of our core identity that goes on. Jesus goes on, he says, let me say it this way. You know well how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of God and the spirit of God. We don't see the wind, but we see the effects of the wind. We see what happens when the wind moves. And being born again, being born in this flesh, the work that God is doing in us is seen by the effects that it has on us. Again, it goes to that core fundamental identity, the effects that God has on us. Nicodemus goes on, he goes, Nicodemus asks, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Again, Jesus gets a little snarky. Jesus said, you are a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics. I can just imagine Jesus rolling his eyes going, oh my gosh, what do you not get here, dude? Come on, man. Um, But again, he's referencing, these are basic Jewish thoughts, who God is, what God wants to do in us. He's referencing back to what he says in verse five, and he actually references on uh, further on, he'll give him some more Jewish context. But he is, he's kind of like, what do you not get here, man? So he says again, Jesus says, listen carefully. I am speaking the sober truth to you. I am speaking of what I only know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. This is not secondhand, nor hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you, if, if I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you these things that you cannot see? The things of God. Again, he's saying, what, what more do I have to do here? What, what, you said at the beginning, you've seen what I do has to be filled with God, but what, what, what are we not getting here? Jesus continues, no one has ever gone up to the presence of God except for the one who came down from the presence of God, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so the people could have something to see and then believe in, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks on him, trusting, expecting, will gain real life eternal life. Again, this is where he's referencing something that's from their Jewish history. As they were wandering in the desert, there came this time where they were in, there was a swarms of snakes and people were getting bitten and dying. And God says, just believe I've got you this. I've got this. And they had to struggle with that. And so God says to Moses, he has them create this bronze statue of a snake. How many of you know what the emblem for medical supplies are? It's a bronze snake on a stick. And he says, if you look on this, if you believe that I am here for you as your God to heal you and to save you, you will be healed. And that's what they did. They would look at him. And so Jesus is saying the same thing. I'm I'm here. I came because you're not going to understand the things of God without truly being able to see. And so I'm here. I'm walking amongst you. And he is giving a little foreshadowing of why we're here today to celebrate because he knew like that snake, he would be lifted up and he would be held on that cross for all to see. But he also knew that that wasn't the end. And he celebrate what we celebrate today. How that conquering brings healing. Again, Nicodemus would recognize this um, as a part of his very Jewish understanding. And it's this point right here that we find those verses. That famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The message of hope that is coming. The God who wanted to, do, hey, who wanted to intersect the world and change the world to bring it back to reconcile it right here. Eugene Peterson writes it this way, and he says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son 
that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Let's go on to the next one. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. And, and this is why. We often stop with verse 16 and 17 is just as important. And this is why. So that no one will need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have whole and everlasting life. God didn't go through the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger and tell the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. God did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Is 17, the way that we normally hear it. Eugene writes on, Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the sentence of death without even knowing it. And why? Because that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God's light streamed into the world, but men and women were everywhere ran into the darkness. God didn't come to condemn us, but we run from it. We hide from it. The darkness is us choosing our way and thinking that it's better or cowering in fear. It goes on, they went for the darkness because they didn't really understand. Or really weren't, they went to the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone makes, it, makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial, illusions, hates God's light, won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. We keep doing things out of our own selfish ambitions, out of, out of fear that we'll lose control or fear that we'll be seen and judged. Shame. Fear those painful exposures. But this isn't why God came. He came to pay the penalty. It concludes with this, but anyone working and living in the truth and the reality of welcomes God's light so that the works can be seen for the, for the God's work in us. Those that choose the light were being transformed. We're stepping into this, this, this new birth, this new life that God is offering us. We're in this sermon series, and last week we looked at Easter past, and we talked about the promise that was to come and, and, and how it points to the Messiah that was coming to bring this new life, to bring a way home, to bring, bring this restoration, and today we celebrate that. We celebrate the resurrection. Friday we celebrated the death weird to sound like you're celebrating death, but it's Good Friday, and we had a service where we talked about that, that it's this weird mix that death is not good, but what was done in that death was good because he paid my penalty. When it comes to my sin, the things that I have done, he took my penalty for my sin and our sin. But it doesn't just end there. He doesn't just take on the punishment that is mine. He did it for a purpose. He did it for a reason. And our hope lies in this. And this is what is our hope for today, for the present. Easter present is about this. He comes and he takes our penalty, yes. But through the resurrection, through the life, there is evidence, there is power for a transformed life. We can be made new. We don't have to live the way that we live on our own, in our own understanding, in our own way. There is a power through the resurrection that brings new life. And that's why we're here. That's, that power that pre- is not just what Jesus did 2,000 plus years ago on dying and rising, but he's actively doing that in our lives today. That's the hope of Easter present God has come and offers us this salvation that we will be transformed, that we will be made new. 
not just change my behavior, but completely and radically change who I am from the inside out. Redesigned back to the way that he wanted us to be when he created us. That's the hope of of the resurrection. This is what God is calling you to. He loved us this much that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believeth, believeth doesn't just mean that I believe, yeah, that's who Jesus is. Jesus says, even the demons believe that I'm the Messiah. Believeth, believing is more than just knowing. It's stepping into that relationship to be transformed, to be made new. That's what the Christian life is about. That's what the church, not the building, but the church, we, the people, are about. And everything that we do is that journey. God put into me the fruits of the Spirit. That was exciting to me to see kids hearing and learning and growing in that. That's what the body of Christ is to be, is to carry this message to the world that God has already done something to introduce the world to Jesus, this Son of God who has come and has made a way for us to be made new. There's hope. There's excitement in that. 